Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. My name's Paul John Dykes and I'm joined today by Laura. Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. Hello. And we are in the presence of a man who is steeped in history, Celtic Football Club, Mr John Sludden. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Paul. John, I got to know you almost by accident, I think, because I was writing a book on Equality Street Kids. I wanted to speak to somebody that knew Brian McLaughlin and I spoke to you over the telephone. Tell me your memories of Brian McLaughlin. Well, first, they've obviously been um, brought up the Moken family. You know, you could hear my cousins talking about this great player, Brian McLaughlin, when we were younger. And then, obviously, when we went to school, some Mungos, you know, when you started playing football, some Mungos, they talk about the ex-players, you know, who were... And Brian's name is always one of the ones you spoke about. It was probably one of the finest players ever at school, and they made a cat and act after that. But most of everybody spoke about Brian. And then, just by luck, um, our careers, Brian became assistant manager at Air. At the time, I was playing for Air. Um, he came back for Australia. And we just we just hit off right away, you know. Brian stayed in Grange, we stayed in Falkirk, so we travelled together, and we just became great friends. If we go further back, just a wee touch, John. You mentioned the Mocken family, very close to my heart because I got yeah. pally with, with your cousin Neely, yeah. yeah, and your uncle was the great Neely Mocken. Yeah. So we, we talk about being born into Celtic. What must that have been like to have somebody who is such a part of Celtic history, and it's your uncle Neely? I think we were younger than that. Oh, you didn't really. I appreciate what, you know, nearly had done at Celtic. It wasn't until we got older, you think, you know, what, what he had done at Celtic Football Club, you know, and obviously all of us the Moken family, all the dream, he played for Celtic. I nearly done that. Scored in cup finals, you know. You think of the history of the club. I mean, nearly is a massive history of the club. Played a part in the massive history of the club. You know, he's taken back to the Coronation Cup. He scored this famous 7-1 game. He scored two. And then he scored five when the first place to score five and again for Celtic and then obviously further on became the coach the famous Lisbon Lions nine in a row and then the centenary he was involved in the background of the centenary so I think when you look back he was a, played a massive part in the history of the club the, the thing as well John is I had the opportunity to speak to some of your family Neely's brothers and, and, and sons and daughters etc through the process of writing his biography and what came through and also from the ex-players uh, from various eras, because as you say, it spanned through the fifties, right through to the nineties. Everybody had a nearly mocking story. <laughs> yeah. How special a man was he when it came to winding folk up and yeah. a special sense of humour? Yeah, when we first grew up with Monkey, you, you actually thought Monkey was quite a shy person, but as soon as he walked in the doors at Celtic Park, that was him. Completely changed. Completely changed. The biggest wind up merchant ever, you know. And because he had so much respect for everybody, you know. The big Billy, didn't they, all the first team players to uh, as reserve team players, youth team players. Nobody would ever say a word back when he left and he was just winding you up, you know, and some of the unbelievable stories of wind ups, you know, it was just I think one of the famous ones was Maka Veni when he Maka was going to equal his score and five goals and he scored four at Hamilton and nearly turned into Big Bill and says, Take him off, he's not going to equal my record and Maka Veni couldn't believe it. And he was walking off, he was obviously was the happy coming off, but you could just see like, nearly sitting in the dugout laughing. He says, well, it was nearly, what can I do, you know? And just the biggest wind-up merchant, if that was his place, you know, that's when he... And I tell my cousins, especially Neil's family, John, Mary, Francis, and that, and obviously young Neil, sometimes they kind of believe it's their dad because they never seen that side of him, you know, but, yeah, it was... About the place, it was fantastic. And also, you see them in the Big Billy and that, they all went to him for advice. Mm-hmm. And then, and the David Hay and... You know, the managers, you could see them in the dugout, they all turned to Neely for advice, you know, because he had seen everything. And he was a massive, massive Celtic Celtic man, you know. Great man who was brought into this and it happens inside the park, stays in the park, yeah. you know, and just protect the Celtic, you know, and everything about it. And that was Neely and great man about the place. And even for likes of myself, you know, the type of person he was, he didn't, he didn't want anybody to think he got me in the Celtic park. So for two years, he, he, I travelled myself. Right. You know, just right. that was why, you know, he was going to say, well, Neil again, he's in there because he's Neil's nephew, you know, so, you know, and it wasn't until 
I signed my first professional forms. He came up to me one day and he says, I think I passed you a road going to Glasgow. He says, I, can, I can pick you up <laughs> two years later. But that was him saying to me, like, you've done it yourself first. Absolutely. You know, and, which was a good, you know, grounding for me. Aye. You know, aye. and the discipline and that. And then after that, I became a member of the famous cars. You know, and the stories in the cars, just unbelievable. Legendary. Oh, unbelievable. But the things they'd done, you know, but I was told, you know, George Conley, Brian, Willie mm-hmm. Temple, Danny Craney, all had to suffer it. So I wasn't going to say nothing, you know. And, and the next day, brothers. <laughs> the next day, brothers had it as well, you know. You're <laughs> driving to Celtic Park in a freezing cold day and they would roll your window down and he'd have a big park and put hood up and you were absolutely frozen. But you couldn't <laughs> say a word because it was nearly, you know. <laughs> and he'd say, you okay, son? I'd like, right, fine, fine, you're frozen, you Freezing. know. And he used to go, you been drinking, son? You drink last night? No, no, are you sure you want to drink? I mean, used to call it, it was a copper top, used to call it a copper top. You been there a copper top? I mean, the time you go to Glasgow, you convinced you had been drinking, you know, I just... <laughs> <laughs> now, but, you mentioned before Brian McLaughlin, everybody that I spoke to that knew him called him Super. Yeah. Nearly was very close to Brian, wasn't it? Yeah, I nearly, you know, I nearly knew Celtic as a special, special talent, you know, and because they've come from the same areas, nearly that as well, and travel, nearly, you know, like, nearly... Nearly tail and, and props possibly the same way you had, you know, I think well, years later the same way young Graham Morrison, you know, yes. you know, and um, which is a sad story even but nearly, you know, I think you tainted but especially Brian and Brian um, was about his mother, you know, his father died when he was young, so I think you know, he was a kind of a father figure for him as well, you know, taking him to Glasgow and things like that as well. And Brian tells a famous story, you know, been been nearly for about a month driving the car and they turn to him one day and says, um, how did I get a driving licence? I only got a driving licence to take me you boy back forth to Glasgow, you know, and of course Brian went to Mrs McGorkin, you know, and says, <laughs> Mum, you know, can ask me how I get a driving licence, how, how will you get a driving licence to take me to the park, you know, and of course Mrs McGorkin phoned Celtic Park in a panic to speak to Big Joke and Big Joke is just, listen, that's nearly just, you know, just forget it, it's okay, he's safe, you know, but I think the, always, the, the story is it nearly says that the first time I'd Seen Big Jock with kind of a tear in his eye when I think when Brian eventually went to went to air and Big Jock turned him down, you know, and done the the deal, the swap deal, and I think Big Jock had to leave Somerset and get get Brian money to get a train home because you know he realised unfortunately it's special talent was leaving Celtic Park. I've spoken to people, John Joe McBride mm. uh, was one of them, mm. the late Joe McBride, and they said, and Roy Baines, the goalie that came a lot later, that during discussions with Jockstein. Mm and asking them about the talents he had signed, mm. the players he had had. Jockstein believed Brian McLaughlin was the best of the lot. Yeah, I believe that. And I was lucky enough to meet somebody that was in Lions as well, you know, and I remember Joe McBride telling the story that one day he went back to the park and Neil says, come on, come on outside here and I'll show you a player. And he turned Brian on the park and he got Brian to hit 40 yard passes to him, um, right foot, left foot. And Brian also had a weekend of a part. He'd say, oh sorry, did you have to move there? And it came straight to your foot, you know, and that was for the early age. And then, I remember being part of the reserve team, the manager, Bob Lennox, was through the park one day, and I'd say to him, you know, I was about Brian, and he says, I remember playing a reserve game, and Brian was playing the right-hand side, cutting, hit one left peg, top corner, second half, came on the other side, hit it, it was right peg, top corner. So he says, oh, he was a special, special talent. And everybody you speak to has got so much respect for him as a player, but mm-hmm. also as a person, you know, and I remember years later, at the PFA awards dinner, uh, we air and Celtic had just won the centenary and uh, Big Billy came up to the air table he asked Brian to go and sit at the Celtic table as their guest and nobody in the air table was absolutely delighted for him you know, Brian was a bit embarrassed but we all said to him on you go Brian you know and Brian went up to the Celtic table as a guest of Big Billy and the staff and the players that's how much uh, they all thought him you know it's interesting that we're talking to you this week of all weeks John because it's been 10 years since we lost Brian yeah Tell us a wee bit about your friendship with him because you got to know him through air and, mm. you know, you were in a junior game with Brian later yeah. in life as well. I just, um, as I say, we, since the first day I met him, we just happened to... It's gone great, you know, and obviously we spent a lot of time together um, and uh, he was just a funny, funny guy off the park. You know, everybody wanted to be Brian's company. You know, everybody. He was a cheeky, he got away with it. He got away with it all the ways and that as well, you know, he's, he's laughs and he's carrying on and that, but it was just... Great part, great guy to have, you know, nights out and that. And you know, I was brought with, with Brian and Moira and Cara and, you know, and we had great, great family times together, you know, and great nights. And one thing as well, he, he was a super singer as well, you know, he was nicknamed Super, super player, super pal, but he was also a super singer, you know, he was, yeah, he was a great chatter. Right. 
he was a great chant as well, so great times. He had it all. He had yeah, it he all. did. He did. Yeah. The thing that we were speaking during the week, John, you, you mentioned, I always imagine someone whose career being taken away from them almost, you know, the mm. top level career, if mm. you like, through bad injury, through a bad, bad tackle, mm. might carry some form of bitterness. But you say that was never there with Brian. Never ever mentioned it. He never ever mentioned it. He never ever thought oh, it could have been, or, you know, and you know, I think Brian was proud of all the hoops. You know, he was, he was brought with that fantastic players, you know, and you, could, you know, they're all give great respect for Brian that he never, ever, never, ever, you know, some of us were obviously probably disappointed with it happened for me, you know, and, mm. but um, no, he never, but then you think of Brian, he, he got his move and then he, he moved to, to Motherwell for 100,000. He became Scottish Player of the Year, so, you know, he, he had a, a good successful career as well, you know, but he just, he just wonder, you know, if he just unfortunately that injury, you know, what could have happened to I know. Celtic, you know. Definitely. Yeah. We were in one of your favourite bars, Laura McCool's, uh, talking to Brian McClure. Brian McClure yeah. played with Motherwell with Brian, That's right, yeah. and he was he was talking about Brian McLaughlin mm. and how great, even at that age, how great mm. he was. Neely Malkin, for me, what I loved about Neely was there was a time, like John says, there, ex player becomes the coach, becomes the kit man, and it was like a boot room mentality, mm. you know. And then you you kind of promoted people from within and. Liverpool always are credited with this boot room. I think Celtic had the boot room. How important nice. is it to see the faces around the park that are familiar to the fans? You're John Clark's now. I think John John Clark's almost the same kind of style. He played Danny McGrain. He's now been a coach for 22 years. How important is that to Celtic? It's just nice to see the whole family. And it's part of the Celtic family and they're still important now as they were back then kind of thing. It's nice to see they're still involved, yeah. mm-hmm. for sure. And then, as a youngster, you then learn who Neely is and you go back and you, and you learn about his successes. Mm. And then you're speaking to people like Charlie Nicholas and uh. Willie McStay and everybody's got right. a story it's about Neely. It's all the stories Neely. that unfold yes. when you, you start mm. digging and start Aye. learning. Aye, it's lovely. I love the Andy Walker story about the boots. Walker signs in 87. Yeah. You had to ask Neely for the boots. He controlled the kit yeah. and he pulls out a pair of 1982 World Cups from the box. Yeah. They'd never been worn. They'd been sitting in the cupboard for five years, and that was Andy's first pair of boots. You yeah. know, you mentioned earlier, John, that you yourself came through the ranks at Celtic. There was a famous game at Wembley, Scotland versus England schoolboys, where yourself and various others, including Paul McStay, came to prominence. Talk to us a wee bit about McStay of that era and your memories of that fantastic game. It was at Wembley, wasn't it? Yeah, it was at Wembley. Yeah, um, I think we made even more special that time. Is that the European Championships were on? The games are all, you know. Draws enough in each. He's defensive, you know. Where all of a sudden this game came on the tail, and it was just two teams attacking, you know, five four, um, and I think that's how it got so much press after it, you know. And, and obviously the maestro was just even then. He was just, he was a man then, you know. He was superb, superb. Then you knew he was going to, he was going to, going to bring a bigger, better things, you know. What yeah. ages were you? Fifteen. Fifteen. Bang the maestro. That was Paul's third year playing at that level, you know, and. You know, even when he was 13, he, could, he matched, you know, even that age, you know, and he was a special, special player. We were, we were talking quite recently in Falkirk, and, and mm. Willie was there, his brother mm. Willie was saying that he did, he wasn't interested in football until a wee bit later, but when they gave him a ball, they realised he had this natural gift. Yeah, he was, uh, and you think about, you know, in the respect to the other players at the time, but Paul had that Celtic midfield as a young player for, you know, and for years, you know, but, you know, fantastic, fantastic player for Celtic, and once again... A fantastic person off the park, you know, fantastic person. But I remember um, Paul he, when he was, he was told he was going to make his debut for the first team. He was involved in the first team, first time. It just another nearly story, you know. And we were uh, myself, Granny, Paul, and one of us with the ground staff at the time, and we're packing the boots for Petodre to go to Aberdeen, and we're getting all the boots sorted and that. And nearly turned to Paul and says, "Hey, sir, your boots are not on there." Big Billy says, "Your boots are going there. What, what, what's your boots are going there for?" And they really looked at it, and that, that was us getting told that Paul was going to be in the, in the first team, you know. And obviously, the three years were absolutely delighted from, but Paul was just totally embarrassed. And nearly said, I think you need to go and speak, speak to the big boys, want you to see you. And that's when he was told he was going to travel with the first team, you know. And so it was nearly mocking it to Paul. Nearly, aye. Nearly said to him, You're busy, you're going to that hamper, son. You know, how you put your boots going there first, son. This is the first team hamper, no reserves. And that kind of forgot everybody thinking. So Paul was going to be the first team tomorrow, you know. And, that's how they broke it then. It wasn't there a week getting told, it was no. just the day before. And of course, he never looked back after that, he did he? 17 you know? year old, you know. 17 year old, went up there and 
played like a man. Yeah, you know, and unbelievable. And unbelievable. And after that, you know. Well, he alluded that night as well, John, to some of the clubs that were interested in buying him through the years. Yeah, I know. You know, I he know. was talking about Juventus. Yeah. He was talking about Inter Milan. They were all in for him. Yeah, I know. People ask me that, you know, you know, people to say something about lack of ambition, but it was lack of ambition. He was the captain of the club he loved, you know, and I think as well, you know, for all the families are close, but the McStay family that time were really, really close family, you know, and I think that's maybe but but maybe thing that for Paul as well to not go away, you know, and but it was lucky for Celtic the mindset, you know, having for all the years, you know, and thankfully, thankfully we've seen the maestro often a couple of Hamden, you know, it was it was great to see, you know. It's interesting, you know, people go on, go on about their greatest Celtic memories. I always mention that Airdrie yeah. Cup final. Yeah. Rubbish game. Yeah. Really rubbish game. Yeah. Tense game. Yeah. But in terms of Celtic memories, because of what it meant, yeah. you know, that was huge, wasn't it? I know. I know. Just, as I say, for, for Paul, I think it was, you know, for Paul and that, and for obviously TB and that as well, but mostly for Paul to go up there and lift that cup was, you'll never forget that. Never forget that sight. It's interesting, Laura, when Kieran Tierney, one of us, <laughs> if you like, he went to Arsenal. You know, different times, isn't it? Will we ever see the likes of Paul McStay with Fair James Forrest saying he wants to be a one club man? Possibly. It's hard though, everybody's ambition's different now, and you can't really criticise somebody for wanting to go to other clubs. And if somebody wants to stay at the same club, it's their, it's their story to write, isn't it? So it's up to the individual. Mm-hmm. But it must be hard now with pressures of like, today's society to think it's that whole Instagram, like Twitter, kind of. That side of the celebrity side of it, it's different, a lot different from back when we were young. Back in the day, it is. It there exist? is a, a real celebrity status now, John. I mean, uh, you later got into coaching and yeah. um, you've seen one of the great talents over the last few years coming through at Celtic, Islam Farouz. Yeah. You mentioned Tommy Burns, you were yeah. very close to Tommy. Did Islam Farouz just get caught up in this modern football of too much money, too young? I think so. I you know. There was nothing better than watching Islam playing for the academy, scoring a goal and that smile on his face. And, you know, when he played, even at that age, I would say, you know, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the academy and, you know, a lot of good talent coming through, you know. And I, I thought, when I seen Aidan for the first time up at Aberdeen, I thought, you're as close to Charlie and, and Paul at that age, you know. And then you had the other ones come through, like Simon, you know, Simon as well. It's very, I, thought, I, thought, I remember Tommy saying to me, we're going to Glasgow Green, he says, watch this kid. He says, this could be the new Mux Day. He's had so much of him. And we've seen him, it was 15, 16. And he was a special talent as well at that time, you know. And unfortunately, same thing that we injured that didn't help either, you know. But, you know, so we've seen a lot of them, you know. And with James, he was promising at that time as well, Carl McGregor, you know. And you, but then I thought to myself, well, Islam looked at him, I thought, hmm, you could be, you could be his close to because he was special, special, special talent. But I think you've got to remember as well what Islam witnessed as a young kid, you know, all the years ago, before he came over here, you know. And, so first and foremost, I think Tommy realised that you had to get coaches you, you could trust, you know, be comfortable with, you know, and same again myself for some reason, you know, I, Tommy thought, you know, myself and Islam had a good relationship and we could work together and I seemed to follow Islam up the, the ranks, you know, and he said to kind of respond to you to, you know, just treat him the way, you know, a kid needs to be treated, you know, because um, once again he was in the house with his mother and his daughter, his sister, you know, so, um, so he looked happy when he came in that, but all of a sudden this Portuguese agent, I think, came on the scene, you know, and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, it turned a wee bit, you know. And I know Celtic, people at Celtic obviously done everything they could, but I just wonder if Tommy had still been there, maybe. I don't know, you know, because Tommy done a lot for the family, you yeah. know, and I think Islam looked up to Tommy as well. And maybe when he went to full time, he didn't have that same being comfortable with some, you know, maybe some of the coaches that, you know, and he just, he just had to just had maybe get his, his mind changed a wee bit, you know, his direction, and, you know, next to down to Chelsea, you know, but I thought he was going to be a you know, an next special talent at Celtic. Mm-hmm. But as you're eating, you know, just even at that age, you know, the, the money it was, you know, getting offered to Islam, you know, for all the, the big clubs, you know. Mm-hmm. I remember he, he came on and played for, I remember yeah, the Tommy Tommy's, Burns game. Yeah, that's right, yeah. How did your relationship develop with Tommy? Because he was a bit older when you were at Celtic Park yourself. Same again, just very fortunate, you know, for some reason, Tommy taking me when I first went as a young kid, you know, like something, you know, it's, you didn't really get involved with the first team, you know, the first team dressing was in there, your turn, the right to get in there, be playing well for the reserves, and then going in there, you never walked into the first team dressing room, if the first team players spoke to you, you were, you know, because you've got to remember, we were all Celtic supporters, you know, and that was our heroes on a Saturday, we were going to watch them on a Saturday, and, but for some years, very fortunate, Tommy, Murdo was good to me as well, but Tommy Cadden was good to me, and, but for Tommy, for some reason, we'd kind of, a, was always giving me advice, and looking after you, you know, and, when I finished up at Bonace, you know, Tommy had 
phoned Wally and says, uh, he says, um, get me slurry to come in, he says, I want you to speak to him about getting involved in the academy. And I couldn't believe it, you know, just, for Tommy to ask me to go in there, just very fortunate, and you know, I was in there for 10 years with Tommy, you know, it was fantastic, you know, because I was only a Celtic Reserve player, you know, but I think Tommy, same as yourself, we have no players at the Park X players, I think it's fantastic, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think Tommy tried to build up the academy, and you know, the ex-players he brought back, you know, and, you know, there was Willie, there was Danny Craney, there was George McCluskey, and, you know, they all played for the first team, so they could tell the kids what it was like to play for Celtic. And then, like I said, myself and that, you knew how much I loved the club, and you, man, enthusiasm would rub off and the kids, you know, just being a part of it. Yeah. You know, and it was a very happy time, you know, at that academy at the time, you know, and it must have been great for the kids as well, having all the, you know, as you say, oh, the, yeah. the ex the first team players who could tell them, you know, and, you know, it was like to play for Celtic, which expected you as a Celtic player, and, you know, that's that's part of you being a Celtic player is, you know, how you on and off the park, which mm-hmm. expected, you know, and so that was, I think, Tommy, you know, he was, he was masses from that, you know, and then he got, Brian got involved as well, you know, we started a, a coaching course in Falkirk, right. you know, and then that expanded to becoming bigger with Brian being involved in it, you know, and but that was Tommy's way, you know, it was very much, you know, family, mm-hmm. family, you know, just, and same again, just for the kids to come in, be comfortable with the coaches and look forward to coming in, you know, because now with the academies and that, you know, there's a lot of pressure on these kids now, you know, when we were younger, it was a boys' club. Yeah. You know, you played for your boys' club, maybe going twice a week. You know, some of us were fortunate we go down to England to train with their teams and that as well. You know, if you're now, they're in there for eight-year-old, and it's, it's, you know, it's probably getting pressure for their parents and that as well, desperate for their kids to play for Celtic, you know, and so, you know, it's different, different environment now, you know, and, and when you see somebody like Cairn going through, going through all that, you know, and um, then getting his move, you know, it's it shows you, you know, how much work it's getting involved in it for the early age, you know. The Cairn Tierney thing, there's going to be people unhappy about it, John, who think the guy should stay for nine and ten, stay forever. That really is a legacy of the kind of youth academy that Tommy had a massive part well, in setting right. up. That's right, you know, and he, you know, Tom always says if you get one through the academy every year, you're doing well, you know, and getting into the first team and how much how much success has Celtic had that since Tommy's, you know, you know, it's Tommy's name for Lennox Town. Do you know you think since Lennox Town's been up how many I went through to go and play in the first team? Cairn, I thought I, th- I thought at first maybe Cairn was going to be the new McStay, you know, just, you know, the way he was, you know, Celtic Celtic boys, Celtic family and that, but as you say nowadays, you know, the what's involved with the finance, you know, mm. and I remember back to when Charlie, Charlie left everybody was, you know, the back then, but for me, you know, as a self supporter, I'll never forget the day when Picked up the paper and King Kenny left, you know, four on the fourth. I'll never forget that, you know. And I, it's a strange transfer fee. Uh, exactly. Four forty. Yeah. But then, so I can relate to how the supporters are feeling now with mm-hmm. Cairn, but they've got to look at, you know, what that has done for Celtic as well and what he's, you know, achieved as a, a young age and, you know, he's been fantastic for Celtic and, you know, hopefully one day he may come back. Going back to Islam Farouz, obviously his career has stalled and the last time I checked, Johnny, he didn't have a club. He yeah. was a free agent. Do you think? A chap like him, a guy like him, still got youth on his side. Could he get back into the game? Could he play at a good level? He could, but um, I think with Islam, he, you know, in the last two or three years, had that many loan, you know, peers out with clubs and that now, so I need somebody to take a chance and um, get him back to what he was. But, you know, he's, he's been floating about now for, you know, the last two or three seasons, not really doing anything. But he's still young, but it need to be somebody, the right person beside him, you know, and getting him back to doing things the right way, the correct way, you know, in preparation for games and what have you. And, but he's still young, so he's, you know, it's just somebody's going to take a chance on him. Who would take a chance on him, you know? The thing as well I always think about is um, he's been written off. You know, mm. you, you read stories and opinions about him, they've just written him off. He's a young man, and we've seen so many times in, in football, and, and more so recently, about how it affects the mental health of these young guys. That's Your son played with Falkirk when young Chris Mitchell, unfortunately, committed suicide. And this is a, a guy who the, the, he was under a lot of pressure. There was a pressure whilst he played full time. Then when he went part time, I mean, what what do you think the clubs are doing, or what could they do better to try and combat that kind of depression and, and mental health issues? I think the clubs, are, you know, there's a lot of clubs now getting involved in that, bringing people in and speaking to speaking to the players, and uh, I think they're all going in the right the good direction uh, to try and protect the players. And know if there's any any signs at all, getting the right people in and speaking to them, you know, and I think you know, the manager now, you know, 
Neil spoke about before and that as well for somebody like him to come out you know must it must help other people you know and then obviously you know, Lee the last wee while as well so hopefully now when you, these people are coming out and speaking about it it's, you know if there's anybody there needing help you know the right people right professional people can help them Yeah and I think Celtic as a a massive organisation such a successful club could be at the forefront uh, you know improving the awareness of mental health issues and another thing that when I started writing the, the book on your uncle I got to meet Graham Morrison you mentioned Graham earlier and I never knew him anywhere like as, as closely as you knew him and it was so sad that, that you know Graham lost his um, battle against cancer uh, recently Tell us a wee bit about Graham because what I felt quite sad about was there was a lot of guys who didn't know who he was. He was at Celtic for years, Graham Morrison. And he was one of Neely's boys as well, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. And he was also very promising, you know, and he told me and Big Stark, he thought a lot of him, you know, and, um, but he was also just a good player. He was a big character as well, as you've seen me. You know, the night in Neely's, yeah. in Neely's you know, the, the book, you know, he went up and, you know, he held told, court, eh? held court, you know. Yeah. And that, was the, that was the type of person he was, you know. Ah, yeah, he was big a great character. Guy. Yeah. Great, great guy. Yeah. It was good to see Celtic represented at his funeral. Yeah, you know, obviously it was devastating for his young family, and I just I thought it was it was interesting that a lot of people didn't know how long he had been there. My pal John Potter was a teammate of Graham's as well, and obviously Mark Butcher was at the funeral. And yeah. such a, a, a talented, lovely young man. You know, it was a, such a shame to lose him. Um, now, what I want to talk about is uh, I met up with a guy who writes. Uh, he set up a magazine called Nutmeg. He's an Air United fan. And he was obsessed with John Sludden because you were an Air United legend. How did your career kind of develop after you left Celtic, John? After I left Celtic, I went down to Leeds on loan for a while. But that was the time, the first time Leeds had a bit of financial problems. Um, and I came back up the road and I had you go back down. But that time St Johnson had come in for me out at Rennie. We had just got in the Premier League. So um, I went up to St Johnson for a couple of seasons. Um, unfortunately, I got relegated. And it's the next season. I think some of the experienced players didn't want to be involved in the first division before you knew that they were struggling again at Christmas time. So I left St Johnson um, and they just happened to, uh, was told uh, Alan McLeod was interested in me the air. So obviously it was a new alley because of, you know, the Scotland and that, but I signed for, for air. And, uh, signed for the air just already first and then went to air, followed the alley onto air. Just by luck, you know, just very fortunate. They worked for me down the air and managed to score a, a few goals in the team and we wanted to win the league. You know, it was a, it was a great time. It, you know, Ali was fantastic. It was a great team spirit he had at the club as well. You know, he just no tactics with Ali. He just brought players in, just let you go and play. You know, and it worked for us. You know, played in a team, very exciting team. Who scored, you know, as I say, scored a lot of goals. And one season, we, the first team scored hundred goals in the, in the season, and that. And so that was the type of teams that Ali, Ali, would you call it? But just, you know, and it suited me. You know, it suited me. And as I say, I was lucky enough to score. Scored a few goals. Fairly recently, you were back into management with East Stirlingshire. What's your your plans for the future in football, John? Yeah, I was lucky enough to um, come back to East Stirlingshire. Was asked to go and put the manager to try and get him back in the week. Had a great time there. We went there with the uh, thinking we'll need to get a wee bit of pride back in the club, you know, because obviously they've been put out of the league and you know try and get a team who's going to play good football, and enjoy the supporters would come and enjoy uh, watching. And we done that. We done that. We managed to. Get, I think we got to uh, be pride back in the club. Uh, everywhere we went, we was, made sure we represented the club well in and, and that own week because it was the first time. And we made a lot of friends in the own week. Um, the team, you know, in terms of the way we played, I think supporters were, were pleased with that. And I think we gave them a lot of good times. Unfortunately, you know, the most important thing was to win the league and it didn't happen. So that was probably the disappointing thing. Um, but also, you know, I was very lucky. My, my son came to play play for him as well so you know that was that was great to, to have him uh, to play for uh, my team and he came and done well for us and scored a lot of goals and, and we try to create that a good family kind of a spirit that comes as well we got the supporters involved and you know uh, so it was it was a good time unfortunately you know they, asked, they wanted to wee change so that's what happens in football but uh, a lot of good good memories there and now very proud papa uh, a beautiful wee granddaughter called Elsie um, so I try to spend as much time as possible with Elsie, Paul and Sam up in this day in Carnoustie, outside Carnoustie so uh, that's where I try to spend all my time now very, very proud Papa Brilliant yeah. John, thank you very much for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind it's been a real pleasure speaking to you Thank you very much Thank, thank you, you sir A Celtic State of Mind can be found at axom.net 
We are sponsored by Fans Bet, the betting company by fans for fans. 